very granddaughter who said this one thing about my dad. He says, Leona, your dad had 15 of you guys? He says, I think God said to replenish the earth, but not for him to do it by himself. <laughs> So my mother raised me to be an independent woman. You know, raising a five-year-old by yourself, well, that, that's good what they were doing, especially back in those early days when, when women didn't have jobs except as waitresses or salespeople or that sort of thing. So I've always, I guess I've followed in her footsteps being sort of an independent woman. As far as leadership, I think uh, I graduated from Northeastern and after I graduated, then I graduated with a degree, and I've got I was the, the year that they last the last year they gave lifetime teaching certificates, and never taught a day. <laughs> so I went to work, worked for a couple three years, and the company I worked for moved to Tulsa. And I didn't want to go to Tulsa. Amen. I'm, the only, I'm the only child, and I lived at home. And I just loved the Scotty, didn't want to leave. After, after the job closed, a week later, I heard of an opening at the Chamber of Commerce. So one Monday morning, I anchored down to the Chamber and interviewed with Paul Bruner, who was the CEO at the time. They called him manager at that point, but that's what he was. And he hired me on the spot. And I said, I'm sorry, I can't come to work because I just quit. My other job was just over Friday, and I won't have a vacation this year. That's <laughs> <laughs> I was. And he said, well, think about it. He said, I'll tell you what. He said, uh, if you'll come to work for me right away, he said, I really, said, we let the young woman that's had this job. <laughs> He said, she's moving to Houston. I have to have someone in the plant manager's office. He said, if you'll come to work on Thursday, or he said, let me know by this weekend. I, at the stretch by 4 o'clock on Thursday, he said, I'll give you a week's paid vacation this time. And I waited until about 3.59 <laughs> and called him and said, OK, I'll be working <laughs> question is, what obstacles have you faced in your career and how have you overcome them? Just 
traveling from, let's say, Australia, you know, and you would be in the hot weather and you have to stay there eight weeks and you're, you can't go back home and change, get the clothes and you have to pack for season after season. And that, that was amazing. Uh, just, you know, trying to get through customs with all this, <laughs> these things back then, it was amazing. But, um, you know, more than just my, my career, because there's always obstacles. There, there's a particular conductor that uh, maybe wants another person in that role, and then they, you know, have to put up with you. But the administration says, you know, I want this one to do it. Those kind of things, those are personality conflicts. But I think I, I'm more interested in challenges now, because I am a, as a female, what, what you're talking about here in these sessions today, uh, at my age, at retirement, and you retire, uh, they always want to retire the women of the singers very early. And uh, Luchana and those guys got to sing, you know, the 72. And so my, my challenge is, uh, you know, I, I, I am still singing, and uh, I just sang in New York, and they said I sang well. And I just, you know, for me, I, I really would like to make a statement and come out as women, you know, we don't need to be retired <laughs> until we want to. I'm very glad to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> I am a feminist, and I have always been a feminist, and I will be on the day they bury me. <laughs> Um, one of the biggest challenges that I have had uh, in my career is that of not fitting the stereotype of what a woman should be doing, and specifically not fitting the stereotype of what a doctor's wife should be. <laughs> because um, lots of people have expected me to do things that I have not done, and they have certainly been surprised by some of the things that I have done. Um, I've had uh, one foot um, in the 60s, I guess, and one foot in this century uh, for a long time. I had the struggle to um, balance having a family, um, ha having a family-owned business, all of that. Um, I think is, is the biggest challenge that I've had. Uh, we've worked it out by having a kitchen at the office. The children came to the office. They had uh, pajamas and toys. And, uh, <laughs> and when they got old enough, they had uh, jobs. So I probably violated a few child labor laws. <laughs> but they both know how to work now. They both can get a job anywhere because they know the value of being a good worker. And um, I think just just facing that, that stereotype and um, uh, balancing the family and the work life as well as I could. Uh, my kids, um, when they were 13 and 14, you know, blamed the fact that they had to be at work or at the office for everything that went wrong in their life. And I said, tough, get over it. <laughs> uh, uh, when, when I think of obstacles, I mean, I can go back to early prejudices in the little rural town I grew up in down in Scott, Arkansas. And if any of you ever been north of Little Rock and to Scott and past Scott, it's a little place called Walker's Kona. Well, that's where I grew up. And I tried to learn all the country things. I can say I chopped cotton and I picked cotton. And I thought that I spoke proper English because I didn't talk like the other kids until I got to California and found out that everything I said to, the, to their ears sounded like, y'all, y'all. <laughs> I thought I was speaking good because I didn't say yes, sir. But anyway, <laughs> that was an obstacle. I, I really tried to curtail them in California and tried to be a California girl, which I thought I was doing pretty good until I came to Muskogee, Oklahoma in the 10th grade and discovered that, again, now I'm an outsider, so that was a new obstacle. But um, I learned that it's really up to you to figure out how to overcome those obstacles. So I found this uh, little Chinese symbol. It's called crisis equals opportunity, and in Chinese, the symbol is the same. 
So it's all in how you look at it. Any situation, whether it's good or bad, is really, it's a crisis, it's an opportunity, it's a challenge for you to address it and make it work for you. So when I couldn't do statistics, say in college, I mean, I really wasn't good with math. I overcame that obstacle by learning how to read very well. You see, you find something else you can do better. And if you do that so good, you know what to pay attention to what you can't do. So when you're in a job interview and they ask you about your weaknesses, make sure you tell them how dedicated you are, how that you don't need a lot of supervision, and that you're a go-getter. Only they may take it as a, as a negative because you worked overtime, you didn't want to leave work. <laughs> It's important that we have role models in our lives. Who is your mentor, and why do you aspire to follow in their footsteps? My current mentor is my last husband, Oscar. I know. <laughs> we have celebrated 20 years since the day we met, and had we met when we should have met, like in the beginning, before I had two previous husbands, I would be celebrating 40 years instead of 20. But the reason, if you've ever met Oscar, you know that he's always laughing and he's always in a good mood. Let me tell you, it's real. And it inspires me on a daily basis. We work together, we play together, we do everything together 24-7. Um, because we're independent entrepreneurs, we're, I guess, couplepreneurs or what have you in the film industry, a business that's very up and down. And if one of us was in, say, like one state of mind and the other one was the opposite, this really wouldn't work. Because one of us would be saying, where's the money? You know, <laughs> let you go get them nine to five, <laughs> something like that. And some of you know what I mean, when you're aspiring to do something different, your significant other can make or break that situation. So the mentors in work, I've had many. I try to learn from everybody I can. Even people who are being mean to me, there's something good in that. Maybe that's a crisis equals an opportunity to see, why do you feel that way about it? Why do I disturb you that way that you have to say bad things to me, things to bring me down? So I have used that person as a, mentor, even though they weren't cooperative, <laughs> and doing that um, to make me feel, you know, in other words, to have to address it and work on myself and realize I can't do anything about the other people, only me. And the same for you. You can't change the people around you, but you can change how you are and how you respond to the negativity of others. And that's a significant thing for anything, probably. <laughs> well, I, I guess I have to say that my mother was clearly the, the model for me. Um, she clearly was one of the strongest women that I have ever known. I uh, have only two children, and uh, after I was grown and had those children, I said to my mother, I do not know how you did it with five kids and no husband. And um, she was a constant uh, support to me. Um, she passed into the next life uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, I cannot tell you the number of Sunday mornings that I wake up thinking, I'm going to call mom and ask her about this. Uh, there have also been some other uh, uh, people in my life who have uh, who've been mentors to me. Um, a high school teacher who was uh, particularly influential. Most recently, um, I have had the privilege to serve on the First National Bank Board of uh, Directors. and. Uh, Carleen Leonard and I were the only two women on that board, and she was extremely helpful to me at that time. I admired her enormously. She was a very graceful and uh, much stronger woman than you would have imagined just 